Welcome to the Cape Ann Finns program on the Main Street Murder, Rockport's Great Unsolved Mystery. Uh, I, I should perhaps start by, by my favorite story about two guys in a bar. One, one says to the other, you know, we're kind of like doing nothing. And the other guy says, I, I think I'm, I'm an interesting person. And the other guy, how, how come you say you're an interesting person? He said, well, re remember that murder and that cop? And, yeah, I remember. And he said I was an interesting person. Did he? No. He said you were a person of interest. <laughs> so we're going to say, in the case of the murder, there were persons of interest and people who were interrogated and all over town in Rockport in 1932, uh, an investigation took place, which did not produce, I mean, it produced persons of interest, but it did not produce a named felon who was convicted and sentenced or brought to justice. So it's an unsolved case. And we're gonna start with that, but first, uh, I would like to introduce Rob Ranta, who is the uh, founder, director, president, everything you can name of the Cape Ann Fins, and Robert, or Fitzy, Fitzgibbon, who has researched this murder beyond anybody in, 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 in history. And I'm very glad he's the expert present with us today. But uh, first, a word from our sponsor, the Cape Ann Fins. Thank you. Rob. Uh, Cape Ann Fins uh, began about five years ago, and we are a, a chapter of the Finlandia Foundation National Organization. We, we formed in order to preserve our uh, heritage and cultural uh, life here on Cape Ann, the Finns, the Finnish Americans, and the Finnish community. Uh, over these five years, we've, we've done a lot to do that. So, for example, we've conducted many oral interviews of elderly Finns. Uh, we've also had um, translations from Finnish into English of news articles that the, uh, church, uh, the halls, the Finn halls and the churches uh, submitted to the Finnish newspapers. And um, we also sponsor uh, sessions called Preserving Finnish Heritage. So we've looked at uh, Finns in the quarries, Finns at work, um, <coughs> uh, Finns on the farm, uh, recently Finns, the Finns dance in preparation for the evening of Finnish American dancing that was held uh, on October 22nd. Uh, most recently at our annual meeting, our focus was uh, the church as a uh, source or a place for social activity. So we're moving along steadily. All of this is being um, recorded by Cape Ann Live. And, um, <clears throat> and so we're pleased now to add this element, the element of a series of um, uh, interviews about Finns, Finnish Americans, and the Finnish community. It was the um, uh, brainchild of Wayne Soini, who was our historian, and uh, he's also an author. Most recently, the, uh, his work is um, Ed and Joe. He wrote that for the Gloucester 400 Partnership, and it, in, it's a story of the a love affair of Edward Hopper and um, Joe Nivison, who actually were here in 1922 as, and celebrated Gloucester's 300th anniversary. So the best part, of course, for us is that Wayne made sure to uh, intersperse in his narrative uh, mentionings of the Finns, and for that we're really thankful. Oh, it was a pleasure. Uh, now, Fitz, if I may turn to you, Whatever got you in, I, I don't detect in you, you're a Finn, so whatever possessed you to get into exploring the Main Street murder? Okay, um, well, as I mentioned, it is a complicated case, but as succinctly as possible, 
on Saturday, May 21st, 1932. Arthur Oker is found dying on the floor of his uh, tailor and haberdashery shop at 77 Main Street in Rockport. Um, May I say, this was yes. at 12 noon. Yes. This or was noontime. A, yes, and so what's, what's fascinating about this is that so he was um, discovered at about 12.50 by his son, Rudolph. There's roughly about eight um, witnesses in a period from like 11.15 a.m. until 12.50 that either stopped by the shop, were in the shop, stopped by the shop, um, or walked by the shop, including a lobsterman, a policeman, the landlord, his son, and... I think there was a lady across the street. The lady was across the, the unnamed lady across the street. So this happened obviously on the busiest shopping day um, in Rockport, so Saturday, mm -hmm. everyone's out and about. And in essence, what happened is that he, that, like, he, put, he pulled his shades down at 11.30. Some people saw him talking to someone in the shadow of the shop. His uh, wife called several times, called him home for lunch. He didn't come home. He didn't answer the phone. She got nervous. She said, hey, Rudolph, my son, go find out what's going on. He went down. He tried the doors locked. He went back, got a key, went back down, found his father bludgeoned with his skull smashed in behind the counter of the shop, the safe open and just a massive scene of a struggle. And I take it, Rudolph, if that's his name, uh, called the police. Yes, that's correct. And the police quite quickly came to the scene. Yes. And actually, uh, I guess the, the gentleman was still breathing. Yes, he was he still was, alive. He's he probably was, unconscious. They, they called uh, for an ambulance? Yep, they called for an ambulance. Now, remember, this is also, you know, 1930s Rockport, so it obviously didn't have the EMTs and systems that we have now. Um, they called for a hospital. One of the officers actually drove the ambulance. Um, he died at 12.55 p.m. Though some of the newspapers at the time kind of embellished and said he died just passing the, um, uh, the church, uh, uh, or Lady of Good Voyage, or whatever, here in Gloucester, but that's probably an embellishment. But yeah, he died. He died without regaining consciousness or uh, identifying an assailant. When the police looked into the background and the family, yep. did they find anything immediately and obviously suspicious about Arthur Oker? No, I mean... What was his background? So he was a, a Swedish immigrant. He first um, came to the United States in about, I think, 1907. Swedish-speaking... Swedish-speaking Finn. Immigrant yeah. from Finland. Yes, that's correct. Came to the United States pretty quickly settled in Rockport, yep. became a tailor, Yep. and then what uh, in terms of family? Well, he was living um, with his wife, Ida, and his son-in-law. Um, where ca where was Nine. that? Do you um, know the... I think it was um, Curtis Street, maybe? I can't not sorry, not I far know. from the... Yeah, but it's like literally 600 the, feet from the... the Main the, Street. Yeah, just, uh, just up. Mm -hmm. um, so he was living, living with his wife. He was living with his son, Rudolph. He, was, he had another daughter. Um, he, was, he actually had a total of four children. He also, you know, as I mentioned, lived with his uh, son-in-law, Captain Roger Martin. And by all accounts, uh, he was an upright citizen. Um, churchgoer? Church, not only a churchgoer, he was actually the treasurer of the Swedish Congregational Church. Uh -huh. So, I mean, if you think of a person that is, you know, upstanding in the community, a, a, a good guy, Arthur Oker would be the person you'd pick. I believe you're the one that researched it, and, and I'm going to ask you, you won't, I think even the coal and oil company trusted him to be yes. their collection yes. agent. Yes, he was a he was a collection agent for the coal and oil, um, the coal and oil company. So if I was in Rockport and I ordered coal and I had three dollars to pay for the load, I went yes. to the tailor shop and gave it in the hands of uh, and got a receipt from yep. Mr. Oker. Exactly. And he was entrusted in the depression with any temptation that afforded anybody who had a little dough uh he was trusted by the coal company to to keep their money in the how much money was in his uh, uh what did the police find uh well they didn't find any money <laughs> which, which was suspicious um they expect they um estimated that based on the customers that had come in that morning he probably would have had about sixteen dollars plus like whatever was in the safe but there was no money on him his pockets were turned out so robbery was suspected. Did they open the safe? The safe was actually found open. Um, the 
the accounts as how much blood was in the safe. Some blood in the But safe. his body was basically next to the safe, which was slightly ajar, and his blood was either on top or inside of the safe. So they did suspect robbery as the initial motive. Um, did anybody think that, was it, didn't somebody say a lottery ticket was in the safe? Yes, so one of the things that they found that was very interesting is they found a lottery ticket, and um, you know, which would have been for about $1,000, which is about $24,000 in, in you know, modern, modern money. So you could buy a house with yeah, that Yeah, this is, this is a big thing. So they um, deduced that, well, maybe there was some sort of deal going on because the lottery angle didn't pan out. The person what happened actually, to the lottery so thing? The person that, that supposedly won the, the lottery came forward and said, no, I, you know, I won it. So this, whatever this ticket was, it was a false lead. Um, but, so, so Oker kept the ticket, but the fella got the money. Someone else. Well, you know, so one thing that's, you know, that's one of the things mm. that's, that's interesting and challenging about, the, about this case is sort of the trying to identify the preciseness of it. There was some sort of ticket in the safe. Um, you know, there wasn't, that's not to say it was the winning lottery ticket. It was a lottery ticket. One of the things that they kept saying, though, is that, well, we think he was trying to work out some sort of deal. They're very sort of, the newspaper reports are very sort of cryptic, that he had some sort of deal going on, um, and maybe it was a sort of a deal gone awry or something. And, of course, you know, you mentioned this is during the Depression. This is also during Prohibition. So a lot of, a lot of deals being done sort of under the table, if you will. Speaking um, of under the table, have to tell the people, there's a sort of a cellar underneath 77 Main Street, the tailor shop, and the cellar goes to a, uh, I guess, a doorway that's on Front Beach or something? Yeah, there's a, there, there is a back entrance. The, um, the initial sort of investigation, the thing that was confounding, it's kind of like a locked room mystery. It's like, okay, the door is locked. Um, there's only one egress in and out, but they're right. There is a back egress to go to the beach. Um, it supposedly had a lock um, that could only be locked from the inside, not the outside. But again, I think these, the stories are incredibly imprecise. I mean, even, even the fact that first they say, oh, there was only one way in and out, and then later on the newspaper reports, oh, no, no, there was a back entrance. And so, like, you know, again, it's like the greasy pole. It's like you think, you think you got, you're going in the right direction, and then you're not. It was prohibition, as you yep. said. And there's a back entrance onto the beach, as you said. Yep. And there's a deal being cryptically if there was a deal. Did people say he was in the wrong place at the wrong time with rum runners or something like that? Um, never quite in so many words. I mean, in the research that I did, um, I was incredibly surprised to the extent of, of rum running in uh, the North Shore and particularly like in, in places like uh, Ipswich, Essex, uh, Rockport. It was frankly everywhere. and. Um, I'm going to interrupt with a, 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 an in, inject here. I spoke with a retired uh, corrections officer who was a uh, corrections officer at what we used to call Walpole. I think it's called Cedar Junction now. The worst of the worst criminals in Massachusetts yeah. go to Walpole. And he told, murders included, he told me that based on what I told him about this uh, event, he said, Murder on Main Street in the middle of a busy day, noontime on Saturday in Rockport, leaving a bloody mess. And the, he thought that it was sent by the mob. Uh, uh, gangsters were trying to send a signal that, for example, if you rat on us to the feds about rum running, this is what will happen to you. Uh, not that Arthur, he, he's, he's no more than us able to say Arthur Ocker knew anything about rum running or reported anybody to the feds, but if they, the mob thought, if the gangsters thought that was true, um, they might take that kind of action. And it wouldn't be behind closed doors and unknown or whatever happened to that guy who disappeared. It would be just like this for the maximum impact on others out there to keep them quiet about the gang and the rum running, which was, as you said, ubiquitous. I've got to ask you, if, if, you, if, you, if you look at this uh, uh, in that way, were there any witnesses to a stranger in town, somebody in the shop 
like wearing a straw hat yes. or what? Go ahead, please yes. tell us about that. So um, two of the, of the uh, customers that came in that morning, they, they, there were several different accounts of, like, of strange men being in the shop prior to the assault. Um, they basically evolved into either a straw-hatted, tall straw-hatted man or two men in sailor suits. Sailor suits. Yeah. Now, okay, please. I've got to get a lineup of sailors from the uh, Coast Guard station. Right, that's exactly what Tell they did. Tell me. Yes. They did. They did. What they, happened? The sailor, they brought, they, they, there was the, uh, the naval radio station on Thatcher's Island, and they brought a lineup of, you know, poor sailors there, <laughs> and nobody recognized them. Um, but they also. So are, the customer who saw the sailors are. It was supposed yeah, to yeah I think it was the postman, actually. The postman who came by, he dropped off a package. It was probably some sort of bolt of cloth. Yeah. Uh, when, the, when the policeman did the investigation, the bolt of cloth was missing. Um, his shears were missing. His, his tailor shears. They're sort yes. of heavy, like scissors. Um, the money was missing. Um, uh, but they, the, the postman who, who originally said, oh, I think it was a couple of sailors. Like, they, just, they said basically the, the, the ID didn't pan out. And they actually went and grabbed... Um, a dead end. They're very, very dead end. They even grabbed like basically hobos off the street and like, or is this person it? No. But the mail, the post office, uh, records, uh, who was sending what, whether this is indeed was yep. a bolt of cloth or, or, or some kind of uh, smuggled goods, I don't know. The, um, the bolt of cloth was, was missing. Couldn't find it. And, and, and there Couldn't was, find it. Was there a murder weapon on the premises? There was not. There was no murder weapon on the on the premises. Um, of course, initially the suspicion came in. Well, his shears are missing. Um, maybe you know maybe that was the murder weapon. So they did this sort of all points bulletin of like look you know who's got who's got the shears and actually a another tailor in Rockport said oh sorry I borrowed his shears but like you know I, I borrowed him during the like. Basically, like he handed the shears back. They didn't have any blood on them. They were fine. But what was interesting is that um, Arthur's wife, Ida, couldn't identify those shears as actually belonging to Arthur. The handle, the colors of the handle were different. Speaking of Ida, mysterious phone call that morning. Yep. Tell me more about that. Um, well, she got it. She, there were several phone calls. What was interesting about sort of 1930s phone technology, I guess, is that like the... Um, the phone actually rang at their shop and their home, and um, so she heard a call. She heard the phone rang. She picked it up. She heard her husband speaking, probably in English, to someone. Didn't obviously she didn't speak English, so she uh, just hung up. But then she later on tried to call him multiple times, and he refused to pick up. It was that was that was the first thing that alerted her. Mm -hmm. So like like you know. Um, why is he not picking up? Because she, she just needed to call him about like, oh, can you go pick up some like deli meats or something? And, and um, he wasn't picking up, and that's what first worried her. Looking back at this, the police, Rockport police, uh, did they get help from the DA's office, the state troopers? Yes. Or, they did. They yes. did. They did. Um, uh, and did they have an autopsy performed yes, by the? Yes, they did. And, and what did the doctor say at the? Well, you know, pretty cut and dry. He had uh, died of blunt thrust forced trauma to the head. The, uh, the number of, sort of lacerations on his skull increased with each sort of newspaper edition. <laughs> Did the doctor determine whether the wounds were consistent with a particular, were like Taylor Shears? No. Or were, so that's no. actually a good point. They, they did not seem like they could have been committed by Taylor Shears. They actually seemed they were more um, similar to a wound possibly made by a um, hammer. Or a sharp hammer, like you'd use in a, like a, a tool you'd use in a, in a quarry. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so and, that, and that was missing. Nobody could find that. I never found the shears. No. Did anybody look in quarries? Uh, yeah, they, that was one of the first <laughs> things. So actually, a lot of so when the when the, the story broke and all the you know newspaper people are coming to to Rockport, they many newspaper people actually did their own kind of ad hoc searches and with a lot of pictures. Yeah. With yeah. photographs. Yeah. On page three. Yeah, exactly. The exactly. The I mean, this is this is the era, of, as you mentioned, of sort of um, you know celebrity or crime uh, crime journalism, um, and this was a this was a big story at first. You know, it just was in the local papers, but then it made it into the um, into the, 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 the Boston uh, papers, and then eventually the Associated Press. Well, I, I kind of want to uh, 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 remind myself, and you would have the details at your fingertips. I think there was some kind of a crazy story of a. 
man who borrowed a car oh, yeah. just said, you know, in a bar room, what was that? So this is one of the, the sort of very strange angles. I don't, I don't know, Rockport was a very, it's a very, very interesting town in the 1930s. So it is the two, what we call salesmen of a silver concern. And um, what happened <laughs> is that- get that phrase correct. Yes, that's the- <laughs> There's a wonderful, the description of the individual is as he's a salesman for a silver concern. Yes. Okay. So what? Ha okay. What happened is that these two in a bar room. No, it wasn't in a bar room actually. So these two, these two. Oh, uh, the Depot Cafe or something. Yeah. What these, was it? These two salesmen uh, were arrested in Rentham, which is on the Rhode Island border, um, seventy-eight miles from Rockport. In in essence, a car that wasn't theirs. And um, so the police said, "What's going on?" They said, "Oh, you know, well, we borrowed the car from this Rockport guy." So the story comes out is that these two salesmen say, "Oh." Um, basically stop a Rockport citizen on the street, say like, oh, our car broke down, can we borrow your tan coupe? Mm -hmm. The guy's like, sure, no problem. <laughs> so they get this car and they're the one, and then they careen off. So that, I think actually the, a lot of the sightings of the straw hatted man are actually these two salesmen. But they end up 78 miles away in Rentham. Like they told, the, they told this Rockporter like, oh yeah, we're just going around, you know, like, the back shore to sort of talk to some of the, the summer folks and see if we can sell some silver. Or I mean, it's just yeah. like a story like this. You're like, what well, is that, going that, on? That, that reminds me, they, they don't marry wives down there. They rent them. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, let's figure it out here. If, if nothing happened and this investigation came and went, as you're describing, raise and rise and fall, after, did the Rockport people ever think there was going to be an arrest in it? Oh, yes, yes, multiple times. Uh, you had earlier asked about, like, oh, who was involved. I mean, first it was the, the of course, the, the Rockport police under Chief Sullivan, who had been a chief for, like, 40 years. Um, and then the, uh, the state police were brought in, specifically at the Detectives Murray and Griffin. And then, of course, the DA got involved as well. But that was sort of a little bit later on. Um, but right from the get-go, though, the Rockport police felt like, like we, we, this, is, this is a big case. We need, we need help on this. And the investigation just expanded and expanded. And the rumors were, there's going to be an arrest. Get yes. down to Dock Multiple Square. Times. I don't know why yep. the, they thought the arrest would be made in Dock Square. Or something. They, they milled around for hours. Yep. And then finally midnight, you know, like Cinderella, it's Go all home. over. It's not going to happen yep. today. So they went home. Yep. Did any, uh, of the, um, uh, any of the evidence take the authorities to locals. I mean, we're talking about the straw hat man and the yep. two sailors and such. In, in their search, did, it, did they go to local people too? So one thing that was very interesting is that, you know, uh, ochre was found behind the sort of the, the um, venture, if you will, like a, a, you know, where his safe was in his cash register or whatever. Um, but the, the, the entire crime scene was like damaged. There were blood spatters, there was like stuff, you know, mashed about. But one thing that the, 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 the um, police found that was very sort of odd and interesting was um, a waistcoat, which had blood, a couple of blood splatters on it, was actually inserted in one of the coat racks. So they suspected that the um, assailant had actually perhaps changed some clothes um, in order to make their he getaway. He didn't want to them. leave the store uh, covered in blood. Right, exactly. Exactly. Um, so that was an indication of, well, perhaps yeah. this is, this is some yeah. local. Um, hey, let me uh, say, it, it came and went, a cold case, no witnesses you know, that panned out, no murder weapon, no postal package that could be traced, no addresses, no, no real suspects, yep. no progress, and the case was closed in 1932. Or well, at least it died out in the newspaper. Technically, I don't think the case is closed. I mean, it's not, not, not really, <laughs> even until this day. Yeah. Right. But then, then, maybe surprise to people except in Rockport, what about the other murder? Oh, yes. 1933. Yep. Oh, more than a year later. Halloween night, I think it was. Yep. You yep. tell us again, like I asked you, what happened? Who was it? Okay, so um, as you mentioned, the in investigation for the Ochre murder kind of went cold by about a month later, so by about June 1932. Um, and later on, a year, a year and change later, with like roughly like 17 months, um, there's a woman named Ada Johnson. And Ada Johnson is a widow. 
Um, she is sometimes called Augusta Jones. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. yeah, Augusta but Jones. In the newspapers, also oh, so Anna. referred to as Anna. Anna. Yeah. yeah. Um, she is another upright citizen. She's I don't know. I think I think probably around fifty or something like that. She works as you know immigrant. Works mm -hmm. as a domestic, frugal. Um, she she married. Well, yes. So this is interesting. Yes, she was a. Um, affiliated with the Swedish Congregational Church, which is the same church that Ochre was treasurer. A card-carrying member? <laughs> well, this is, the, this is the thing, is because actually the, the Reverend Johansson, who was the pastor of the church, denied that she was ever a, a member of the church. Yet, however, she attended a surprise birthday party for him on a Tuesday, Halloween night. And that was the event that supposedly she said, I know who did it. If they don't turn themselves in, I'm going to the police. She said at a party. She said attended at a party. By 20 well, that's, so this is the thing that's interesting. There were probably 20 people at this party. Um, that who, if they, if yeah. they don't, if they don't, I'm putting, if they don't confess this week, I'm going to the police. Yes. Okay. Yes. To the ochre slave. Yes. So. Of course, the like who exactly was at the party and what exactly was said is the because you know, like, what happened after the oh, party. Oh well, let me. All right, so get to it. So she says she supposedly says this. Um, the next day, neighbors notice smoke pouring out of her uh, bedroom window. She's on the second floor. On the second floor. This is what a, what, this is a one area? Oakland Ave um, in Oak, the Pigeon Oak, Hill Oak, area. Yeah. Okay. And Pigeon Cove. No, not Pigeon Cove. Pigeon Hill. Pigeon Hill. Yes. Okay. Um, just just above you know. Uh, higher than the cope. Uh, neighbor across the street, uh, Warren Olson, knocks on the door, can't get in. Basically, he kind of breaks in through a, like a, a, a window pantry, and he discovers her on her bed uh, on fire. And the police come, and they determine that she has been bludgeoned to death with her skull smashed in, placed on the bed, and then placed on, and then set on fire. And this is the next. This is literally hours after this Halloween party. People don't know otherwise, but they put out the fire, they saved yep. the house, yep. but they have this murder scene now to investigate. Murder number two, yep. uh, somehow, possibly, related to the ochre killing of the yes. year before. Yes. The, uh, um, and did anybody come around, like from the state police or oh, uh, this was newspaper reporters? Again? So, so the case just exploded. Um, you eventually had... Uh, 35 state police troopers and four detectives working full time on the case for months. Um, Got to say, because we usually have a movie scene in mind, <laughs> how this is going to play on a movie. One of these state troopers was a, I don't know, former or current was uh, a Baptist minister. Baptist minister. Yeah, he was. And and when he arrived in Rockport and realized this, these people had some church relation. One was a treasurer of this church, and the other was a uh, attended, attended, attended <laughs> surprise yep. parties of yep. the church. Uh, he got into his ministerial robes and assumed yes. the pulpit and one. What yes, happened? so um, the, 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 the Johnson case, you know, the, the Ochre case generated a little bit of publicity, the Johnson case exploded that publicity. And, and then, you know, again, reported nationwide, the, the DA is like, we have got to solve this. We've had two murders. You know, the, this, the, the Ochre murder was the first murder in Rockport in 55 years. And then 17 months later, you've got the Johnson murder. This is serious. Um, the Swedish Congregational Church clearly seemed, there seemed something off there. Uh, uh, Thorsell was, a, he was a state police trooper, but he was also a Baptist minister. And State under, Trooper Thorsell. Yeah, he actually became the, and becomes yeah. the yeah. He, and he actually became the um, pastor for the State Police eventually. Okay. Anyway, so around about November thirteenth, uh, nineteen thirty-three, he is he gives a sermon at the Swedish Congregational Church, and he's wearing his yeah he's wearing his uniform you know with his puttees uniform underneath underneath the, underneath like a black you know kind of like yeah. clerical robe. And he kind of gives this really interesting uh, sermon where he's like, well, I don't think the murderer is from here, mm. but if you know anything, could you say something? <laughs> and he ends it with, come to Christ with your confession of sin. Come to Christ with your confession of sin. He's pleading with the congregation. Brilliant movie opening, mm. I tell you. And they say nothing. Nobody says nothing. anything. Nobody Everybody looks at anything. each other. 
everybody looks at each other. Nobody says anything. Uh, at this time, I understand the state troopers, 35 of them, yep. with time, yep. uh, time on their hands. That's going to be edited. Yeah. <laughs> uh, go out and interview 3,700 yep. rock porters. Yep. I don't know, men, women, and children. They must have said, I mean, if, just counting that up, if you interview 3,700 people, there's 3,700 pages yep. without saying anybody was lengthy, and then there'd be two or three pages. That file, is, which used to be 100 pages or something when they were doing the ochre, had to have been a box now of thousands yes. of pages of material. They That's interviewed correct. all those households. They did. So um, the uh, state police um, and the detectives actually set up shop at the selectman's office in town hall. Uh, they stayed there for, for weeks and weeks. The um, st state police troopers were billeted at people's homes, and they literally went through every single structure in Rockport and interviewed every single, as far as I know, adults. I know they adults did children, but they interviewed everybody. Hmm. Do you know anything? Did you see anything? The, the, the investigation was, was kind of bedlam. I mean, even to begin with, um, Chief Sullivan basically got um, kids from Rockport High School to help like home the area around uh, Ada Johnson's house, which was probably, probably, probably not like, you probably wouldn't see that kind of approach on CSI or something. <laughs> <laughs> Nonetheless, volunteers or not, officials or not, didn't they find some bloodstained newspaper? Yeah, what they found bloodstained newspapers. I mean, there's all these sort of strange loose ends where they find newspapers, they send them to MIT or they send them to Harvard for analysis. I mean, again, it's the sort of like, there's all these sort of snippets of information and they just sort of fade away or die out. Um, they found, you know, several hammers, one, one of which was uh, suspicious in, in one shed the, and an accelerant because, because the accelerant and the hammer were found together. It was thought that this might be connected to the Johnson case. So they sent that for analysis and again, then it just disappears in the ether. Right. Um, I, I, I um, have got to say, in Rockport, people were, it, everybody was being interviewed and people yep. were talking with each other. Some people were interviewed more than once. Uh, one of our members uh, said publicly, so I don't think he'd mind, I'm not gonna quote his name, but said his grandfather came over from Finland and was a quarryman and was big and burly and yep. had muscles and therefore yep. could handle a sledgehammer. And he was interviewed several times yep. by the, uh, I suppose, state police uh, about whether he had any relation to the, and he didn't live too far from uh, Augusta Johnson, I think. Mm -hmm. um, uh, another person, a woman, said that she had uh, uh, her mother had told her, her that their, uh, her, her father had been um, suspected, mm -hmm. it was one of the suspects, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, had been interviewed more than once on this matter, and that rumors throughout the town associated his name with yep. this original slang, and, and, and unfairly, uh, and so forth. So it seems like in Rockport, with the police, active as they were, at least by the time of Augusta Johnson's slaying, names were flying around, yep. multiple names. Yep. It was him, it was him, it was him, and it, it may be, it, I mean, it wasn't all of them, and in fact, it could be none of them, but people were sure from Augusta Johnson's event, it was a local. Yes, uh, the, uh, it was interesting because the, the, the Johnson case, Thought originally was is that well maybe it was a transient you know and this is one of the reasons that they did searches in the woods and all that kind of stuff because and again again go back it's the depression there are a lot of hobos around um, people are noticing like stuff being stolen from their from their cupboards you know uh, uh, but they the police and the and the state police um, quickly pivoted to saying no we believe that this is a rock porter we believe that the, both murders are, were done by someone known you know to the victims. Um, and they, the DA went so far as to say, yeah, we have five suspects in mind, two of which um, um, are members of the Swedish Congregational Church, and one of which is a prominent citizen, as they described it in the Swedish um, Rockport community. The um, Sandy Bay Historical Society's records has, among other things, a, a handwritten list of five names, and it is not with any indicia 
it was no name. There's no no author, and there's no statement. For instance, quoted from the police or right. and nothing. Right. It's just a handwritten piece of paper with some names and some other information on this page. Can I see it? So <laughs> <laughs> I'll show it to you after the <laughs> show. But th th this is and and uh, uh, may I say, uh, Rob mm. Ranta. Uh, we've opened a file of our own, our archives, and uh, uh, Rob Branta received from uh, a local family in Ro Rockport. Um, uh, somebody went through, you know, searching for old papers, and they found this document. I think it's four or five pages, and it's, I think, typed, mm -hmm. typewritten, um, a, a statement, a lot of details about uh, one particular of these five names, one particular person that was uh, in a position of uh, proximity mm -hmm. uh, uh, to Main Street at the time, uh, and almost with little more than that, uh, told why it must must have been him who did this murder. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, without, uh, uh, there's no author named in that either, is there? So, yeah. But it's a type document. Mm -hmm. it looks like it goes back a lot of years. Somebody wanted to preserve their recollections or what knowledge they had of this. And uh, the, the Sandy Bay Historical Society received and filed uh, somebody's um, uh, comments that much later, uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, 1971, um, a, 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 a mafia figure or uh, gangland uh, hitman named Joseph Barboza Barron was in town. I think he was secured in a lighthouse or something. Thatcher's Island, yeah. Thatcher's Island so and at the time. Wow. And, mm -hmm. uh, and the, the um, uh, speculation that's on this uh, uh, document, along with, uh, along with uh, a poem, I think, uh, it says, uh, he, uh, the poem is actually by Joseph Pope. Uh, it says that uh, you know his time in as a hitman went back to the 1930s. Mm -hmm. So there, there. What is it doing in the file except that they were proposing yet another suspect who would would equate with the uh, straw hat figure, somebody from out of town who's a gang man, a hitman, and they suggest that he's only returning in such essentially returning to the scene of mm -hmm. crime. I don't know. I'm putting that to you. Know, that, that's, that's really interesting. I mean, one, one, one challenge I have with that is that, that Arthur Oker, by all accounts, was like a very upstanding, upright man. And yes. treasurer of his church. Um, family man. Family man. I mean, like... like Long you know, in the community. And, and no sort of known, none that we can know now, like no ties to any sort of like, you know, run running or organized crime or anything. Right. I mean, like there were other individuals that definitely were known. I mean, like, I think that's also what's sort of interesting about it is that um, there were a lot of local run, run runners and like, it just, but he, Arthur's name does not sort of come up as like someone who was like, you know, arrested or involved. Um, and what's, what's, you know, and, but, 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 and again, this is the greasy pole because there's always a but. So like um, uh, months after the murder, it, um, uh, what's her name? Ida, Ida Oker's license plate somehow ends up on a car being driven by two arrested rum runners um, <laughs> from Ipswich. And, you know, it was again like, is this your car? No, we bought it in Salem. I'm like, well, no, you didn't. We checked them. Anyway, so it was a very, again, this another sort of strange little like thing. Like how did her car license plate end up on a car being driven by two people arrested with 10 pints of liquor mm -hmm. in their car? Again, it's just this weird little tangent that again makes this, these cases so mysterious. Well, I, I, I uh, uh, refer back again to this box of thousands of pages uh, in which people were um, asked to talk about suspicious neighbors, somebody who might be rum runner, somebody who might have reasons to uh, kill, to protect their uh, livelihood, or who had bad feelings or bad blood. And, and things apparently were coming out in these interviews where someone would say, yeah, Joe Smith down the block said he wanted to kill his wife, you know, the day before 
Oh, God. It's like the Salem Witch Trials. Uh, the, so you, yeah. you get, but these records, these statements, these police reports existed indiscriminately in a huge file. Yep. Far, and this is before computers and uh, alphabetization that would be easier across references like the Dewey Decimal System. Mm. This is before that police organized file like that. And so if anybody was going to try to find anything in this box of documents, I guess they start going through all of them. And this is any person who's a police officer. And police officers in common with anybody else tend to occasionally say gossipy things that they encountered in the, <laughs> oh, I guess that guy's a sh skirt chaser. Sure. Mm -hmm. How do you know? Well, the ochre file. <laughs> right. so, I'm sorry to say, and you may know this already. Well, I'll ask the question, and you, you'll come up with the, the detail. I think. Did you see the police report? Did you see the police file in the Rockport uh, police station on this uh, murder? On these murders? The only um, evidence that the Rockport police have left is um, some pieces of um, Augusta Johnson's skull and her. Um, uh, Glass, her bifold, her glasses. The all the paper stuff has been has been thrown away. It was supposedly thrown away in 1944 when um, Chief Sullivan retired. There, there's you know a lot of people are like ooh that's kind of creepy. Um, it may have been just a um, a case of just saving space because well the, here we go. Remember I said the stakes were high when they were investigating because it would always be yep. this 16 year old who's collecting the newspaper clippings was on the right track. This is important. Yep. It's going to have significance. It's going to tell us what the world is made of and how things really happen. Yep. Well, if you have a police file, thousands of pages, and lots of information in there, some of which is relevant to the two, two open murder cases, yep. um, usually you wouldn't throw, <laughs> wouldn't throw it away. You wouldn't throw them out. <laughs> and um, <laughs> that leads somebody to say, hmm. Five names, one of them prominent. The prominent people get protected by the police chief who throws away everything so that prominent person, who must be the guilty one, will never be caught and see justice. Well, I mean, that kind of thing was going on. The files are missing. Uh, I think a district attorney could prosecute a police department who uh, uh, who uh, destroys a file, an open file. When I was speaking with my retired correction officer and mm -hmm. I told him the police file had been destroyed, he said, what, open file, that was bad. Yeah, it's <laughs> Apparently it's a, 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 potentially a crime mm -hmm. to uh, like interfere with a police investigation, uh, open police investigation. So that happened. You can't find anything right. of any documentary remains yep. of what, the kinds of things that you've studied, I guess, you tell me, are from newspapers and magazine articles through the years. Yeah, I mean, I did my research at the Rockport Public Library, uh, the Gloucester Public Library, and a, a lot of, you know, online, you know, basically the Boston Globe, the Boston Post, the Bridport Daily Herald, the Cape Ann Advertiser, Gloucester Daily Times. And they all covered the case. They, yeah, this, is, this, this case was absolutely, absolutely huge. Yeah. Um, the files are missing. Uh, what's interesting, so so Roger Martin, who was the, I believe, the grandson of Arthur Oker. I am going yep. to show his yes. photograph yep. on this, at this moment. This is Roger Martin, Professor Roger Martin. He did teach at a, a, a local college and was the, uh, uh, known as the uh, Poet Laureate yep. of, of, of Rockport. He was the grandson of the late uh, Arthur Oker. I think he's posing here out in front of 77 Main Street. Mm. But anyway, yes, please. Uh, well, yeah, so um, Roger Martin did some, res you know, did some interesting research. And his daughter had actually been asking him for like, hey, well, can, you, can, we do, do it, can we find some more files? And so apparently he actually contacted the Mass State Police. And what was then sort of odd is that the Ochre file for the State Police is missing. Or the, the State Police as well? Yes. Oh, geez, I did yes. not know. Okay, uh, uh, if filling out the images that are, I don't have a picture of it, but Rob, you can remind us 
the uh, church that they belong to is no longer a church, but it's a, it's it's a, a family. still standing building. Right. Uh, the Granite church Street, is, is located on Granite Street in Rockport, and for people who know Granite Street, it's diagonally across from Burbank's garage, formerly the Granite Garage. Um, and uh, people live in it now. It's still, it's still here. Um, and it has not those been torn people, down. Those people don't have an open house to tell you. <laughs> don't visit, <laughs> they were, don't visit um, the church. But this is originally the church where the state trooper yes. took the pulpit and asked for people to come forward or confess to Jesus. Or whatever. Okay. Uh, but this is a picture of the modern day uh, of Arthur Auker's uh, tailor shop, which is today, uh, I think, Don. Uh, Blaskovich uh, has a uh, uh, an art gallery in, in it on 77 Main Street, and uh, when I visited and spoke with Don, I, I said, um, "How many people have come through here asking about this murder?" Mm. And he said, "You're the second person." <laughs> yeah. Apparently, people don't actually—it's not a shrine. Mm -hmm. People don't go to the old tailor shop, especially now. It's not a tailor shop. Um, and uh, but but he he uh, did have uh, a couple people. I think uh, probably it was Roger Martin, and <laughs> and uh, he he, he uh, specified that there's no ghosts. He doesn't. Oh, he has no ghost bad. on the premises. Oh well. And uh, this is a picture actually of both uh, uh, Don and uh, Roger Martin at. 77 Main Street oh, wow. before it became an art gallery when it was a, uh, a, a uh, what do you call it, coin-operated laundromat. Right. And, and wow. that's, that's what it was. And uh, earlier, before the coin-operated the coin um, use of that spot, um, Johnny's Restaurant was there too. Really? Yeah. Wow. And that was the freak, you know, the locals frequented that place. Um, without doubt, the um, oh, that tunnel, it, you've seen this picture because yeah. you look through all these. Yeah. There is a t picture of the uh, Gloucester police mm -hmm. in the tunnel underneath the shop uh, that had this uh, uh, lock. You could only lock from the inside or maybe didn't. And they're looking for this. And at the time, the caption reads, of course, these are things that inaccurate or accurate. The Gloucester police investigated an underground tunnel, similar to that which Bradley believes the murderer escaped through. So the, the, one time the theory was he escaped through this tunnel. Yeah, the, then the, it was the, the every the single in. seaport on the Massachusetts coast supposedly has underground tunnels, you know, used for abolition or, or um, you know, rum running or well, ghosts or whatever. With, with due respect, if I had a straw hat and a trench coat and my, my vest was no longer yeah. bloody. I don't think I'd choose to, <laughs> in May in 1932, I'd choose to erupt, erupt from a doorway onto the beach yep. mm -hmm. and then run for the bus or something to get out of town. I think I'd probably go through the front door, it locks behind me and I go on my way. Right, which implies that maybe someone like who knows the layout of the shop and um, you know was aware that there's a back entrance. <laughs> yes. You know, which then leads into well is again is this someone that was a local. We always have uh, 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 photos. I mean what, I guess you don't want to be um, Mrs. Philip Sanborn, innocent bystander, because you, you could be on Candid camera, right. <laughs> surrounded by police officers <laughs> interrogating you mm -hmm. <laughs> about a murder. This is a, it's, again the, the whole town of Rockport was questioned. And this photo simply shows the troopers quizzing Mrs. Philip Sanborn on the steps of her home. <laughs> I don't think she framed this and put it up over the mantelpiece. <laughs> But uh, then there's a whole gang of people, as you've described, yep. that came in for a month working in Rockport. 
Uh, and there's other pictures in the Sandy Bay Historical Society. May I say, people think this is the man with the hat. Yes. A very grainy photograph. Yes. <laughs> I don't know. Anyhow, I really thank you both for attending. And I must say, uh, uh, we're approaching the moment of, of, of truth in this program that we must say almost goodbye. I'll turn it to the sponsor. And if you have a word or two, you've got 30 seconds. Uh, Wayne had mentioned that um, only two people had come and asked about the Oka murder. And in a way, this is exactly what Cape Ann Finns is, tends to do. People of my generation, maybe a little bit younger and certainly older, are the last people to have lived among the Finnish Americans, first generation, our parents, and our immigrant grandparents. And stories like this need to be preserved for p people in the future. Younger f people with Finnish blood um, are assimilated and may not know this. Thanks very much. Next time, keep in friends.